when a multinational organization goes into a location, they will sort of transfer knowledge onto the domestic from They use a variety of mechanisms to protect this knowledge. You also see kind of foreign firms go to those types of locations in hopes of absorbing knowledge uh, out of, I want to say, out of the universities, out of the government laboratories. Academia and universities are important as sources of uh, cheap labor, but they are really seen as, um, as disconnected from uh, the commercialization of products. Welcome to International Business Today, where we discuss the most critical issues in international business with top academic experts and thought leaders. I'm Paula Calajuri, a professor in the International Business and Strategy Group at Northeastern University's DeMoor McKim School of Business, the sponsor of this podcast. Today, we're talking about location choice and technology clusters and what this means around the world. We have a leading expert to talk about this, especially in emerging markets. I am so happy to welcome my colleague, Anna Lemon. Anna is an associate professor at Northeastern University. Anna, welcome to International Business Today. Thank you, Paula. I'm excited to be here. So, so Anna, tell me about the location choice technology link. Like, what is that? Well, I mean, firms obviously locate abroad. I study this in the context of emerging markets. And one of the key issues in emerging markets is, you know, do foreign firms bring technology to these locations? And then does that technology diffuse to domestic firms? A lot of folks hope that that is the case. Um, but a lot of research has actually found very mixed findings. And oftentimes that that is not the case. Foreign firms, um, especially when they are operating in emerging markets which have weak um, intellectual property rights, you do a lot of things to protect their knowledge. And as a result, domestic firms find it very difficult to learn from foreign firms in those markets. And in fact, um, a lot of domestic firms, especially kind of new startups, would be better served by locating near other domestic firms, um, especially maybe like technology leaders in their field, um, rather than foreign firms. So there's the allure of the foreign, but in, in reality, um, it's actually other domestic firms that are going to be really good sources of knowledge for new entrants. And, and that's when you talk about clusters. That's mm -hmm. really what you're talking about. But I want to go back to something you said, that the hope when a multinational organization goes into a location, the hope is that they will sort of transfer knowledge onto the domestic firms. But you said that's not happening. That's right. Because they're protecting their knowledge? Is that? That's correct. Is that that's correct. They use a variety of mechanisms to protect this knowledge. Um, so one thing that they do is they kind of um, segment their knowledge into different bundles, if you will, and will only transfer one bundle of, of knowledge to you know, a foreign market. And you need basically the whole, the whole stack of knowledge to actually make the product or the service work. Um, and so domestic firms aren't able to absorb the rest of that knowledge because the rest of that knowledge is they not located. The whole, <laughs> they don't right? have all the, the information. Right. right. So, so can you give us an example of that? If I'm a, a, a business leader and we're, we're sort of positioning ourselves into an, in another subsidiary in, a, in an emerging market, and we're trying to figure out kind of what info to share, what not to share, like, can you... Can you share an example of that in practice? So, I mean, a lot of firms, they will establish sometimes what are called centers of excellence, which sound great from, you know, the outside. And it's wonderful you're creating this amazing center of excellence. But really that center is just focused on kind of one very specific task, if you will. So it could be, you know, um, testing or quality assurance. Um, it could be just focusing on clinical trials. Um, and then you don't get kind of the rest of the research um, that you need. Yeah, yeah, that, that, that makes sense. And then the way that that knowledge, so, so if I'm listening to this and I'm saying, you know, being called by my other organizations in the region that, that make up part of that cluster. The question is really, what can I share? What shouldn't I share? Do you have any guidance around that? I don't know about, about what kind of what should they share. I know what they do share, 
What they do share tends to be older knowledge. Um, it tends to be more standardized practices, uh, stuff that they don't mind basically leaking, if you will, mm -hmm. to domestic firms. There's uh, several other things that they do to basically um, protect their knowledge. Uh, they also pay very high wages. Uh, and so uh, oftentimes double or maybe a third higher than uh, domestic entrance, and that's to prevent employee mobility to domestic firms. Um, and as a result, you don't see, you basically almost see kind of two ecosystems developing, one around employees that move around uh, multinationals, uh, subsidiaries, and then another one of employees that move amongst domestic firms. But you don't necessarily see a lot of cross movement Right. Um, so they, they do that as well. Um, they also obviously uh, would try to have employees sign non-compete agreements, but often those agreements are practically unenforceable in a lot of these countries, and the firms know that. Uh, they also try to have uh, employees work on multinational teams. So again, um, put a couple of employees from the local subsidiary on with a team that is located, let's say, in the home country or in other markets where you have very strong intellectual property rights. Um, and as a result, again, that knowledge, you know, they'll have a lot of times maybe the employees even uh, fly to those locations to work together and to learn. Uh, but again, you're going to limit the kind of the spread of that information. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, it sure does. It's really interesting. You talk in your research a lot about knowledge spillovers. Can mm -hmm. you tell us what that means? So knowledge spillovers are basically um, information, if you will, but more tacit information uh, that is shared with, um, you would say, employees or people outside of your organization. That, that would be an example of knowledge spillover. And a knowledge spillovers really um, focus on the tacitness of it. So again, it's not necessarily standardized knowledge, not necessarily something that I can hand you a manual and you can learn about it, uh, but really something that, you know, we sit down, we talk about it, and I explain it to you in a way that really makes sense. Um, or maybe I even show it to you. Um, and so then you're like, oh, this I understand. I understand either how this works or how this part relates to this and what are the implications of that. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's the essence of knowledge uh, spillovers. Is there's an element of tacitness to it. Um, and that's why well, co-location or locating in the same place together is so important for knowledge spillovers because you can't, it's very difficult to transfer that um, across borders or across towns because again, that implies more of a standardized knowledge. And, and that's really when you talk about industry clusters, that's the idea that that spillover is happening within that cluster. Can, can you tell us a little more about industry clusters? And I know you studied them in emerging markets, maybe a little bit about that. Yeah, so I mean, in um, I want to say in developed countries, you know, the the key elements that you need for an industry cluster are going to be things like academia. It's going to be like uh, universities and perhaps even government laboratories, right? Um, because in those of, in developed countries, those are where cutting edge knowledge is really being discovered and worked on. Um, and as a result, firms want to locate around those types of institutions in order to hopefully learn about that knowledge and find ways to incorporate it into products that they can subsequently commercialize, right? Uh, and as a result, you also see kind of foreign firms go to those types of locations in hopes of absorbing knowledge uh, out of, I want to say, out of the universities, out of the government laboratories, out of academia, and perhaps out of the domestic firms that are also operating in those environments, startups, let's say. In emerging markets, it's actually very, very different. Mm, um, you don't necessarily see uh, universities and academia being uh, the locations of cutting edge knowledge. In fact, it's really foreign firms that are viewed as the ones that are bringing knowledge to those locations. So again, in developed countries, you basically see foreign firms are entering those markets in order to absorb the knowledge. In developing countries or in emerging markets, foreign firms are going there to transfer the knowledge there. Or so, you know, a lot of policymakers 
and a lot of uh, entrepreneurs in those countries and business people hope so. Um, and that's a, a really key difference between, you know, uh, emerging and developed countries. Um, and again, I want to say that um, academia and universities are important as sources of uh, cheap labor, but they are really seen as, um, as disconnected from uh, the commercialization of products um, and disconnected from working on the cutting edge of research, if you will. And that's in, in, de in, in emerging de markets in emerging and developed markets. countries, yeah. So, so can you give us an example of that? I know you do a lot of work in India. Can you can you share an example? Sure. So, like in um, in India, I study uh, Bangalore, and you know it was inf it was said by I think the founder of Emphasis that the universities there were really played very little role in terms of getting their companies off the ground and um, helping them, you know, bringing new knowledge to them. Is there, you know, in Bangalore, have you seen changes over time? Have you seen the yeah, so clusters I, change? Absolutely. So if um, there's been kind of several changes, obviously. Um, one change has been basically the emergence of, you want to say, kind of related industries. Uh, so industries such as animation, graphics, visual effects have started to emerge alongside the software services industry. Uh, in addition, uh, Bangalore has been kind of a source for e-commerce. So uh, a key company, Flipkart, uh, started in Bangalore. And that's kind of a, an Amazon clone uh, started by two former Amazon workers. Uh, and then also uh, in more recently, there was a, a, a social commerce platform company called Misho that started also in Bangalore. And so you see kind of the emergence of e-commerce and m-commerce uh, companies. You see the emergence of, of, of visual arts uh, and, um, and animation as well. So you see the emergence of new kind of um, related industries. Uh, in addition, what you also find is the importance of different locations within Bangalore changes over time. So, Tell us about that. Yeah, so absolutely. So originally, a lot of foreign firms uh, located in an area in Bangalore called Whitefield. Um, and that was basically because when Texas Instruments, which, which was the first foreign firm that located in Bangalore, they set up shop in Whitefield. Um, and so other foreign firms basically copied and also all went to Whitefield. Um, so at the beginning, you saw a lot of domestic firms wanting to also co-locate in Whitefield and preferring that kind of location over other locations within Bangalore. But over time, you see um, the importance of that location for domestic firms begins to de decrease. It's still important, but that the relative importance of it actually declines. And, so, and you begin to see the emergence of new areas uh, um, start. Does yeah. that make sense? Sure does. It, it's really interesting because you're talking about organizations kind of following each other and, and moving from in, in real space, right, mm -hmm. in geography. Yet the world has become so virtual now. Yeah. Are you s seeing a de-emphasis on these clusters, or is it still no. going to be important? Yeah, no, we don't. Um, I actually, when we first uh, started a research paper that I'm working on, we really thought we would see this. Um, so we collected a whole bunch of data on cell phone usage uh, because, again, one thing that's happened in the past 20 years is you have the proliferation of the Internet or the growth of the Internet. You have um, the broadband speeds have increased dra dramatically as well, right? So you have greater connectivity. Smartphones have, you know, arrived and taken off and penetrated all of these markets. Uh, um, and, and so you, and in addition to that, uh, tr transportation costs have decreased in the sense that airfare has dramatically fallen. Uh, how much you would pay to travel to these locations has decreased considerably. Um, and so you would think that with all of this, you know, locations wouldn't matter. You would see kind of a more spreading out of firms. Yeah. Um, and so initially in my, our paper, we collected all this data on cell phone usage in uh, Bangalore. And then we ran the data and it just didn't, it, it didn't matter. It, it just it had no effect whatsoever. It did not explain anything. Really? Um, and so we had to pivot away from that. Um, and we still have um, a hypothesis in there 
that basically talks about traditional um, industry locations, so like Whitefield or Electronic City. And again, we thought that, you know, these traditional locations that have been around for decades should decline in importance um, because, uh, you know, they're, they get congested, they get expensive, new locations spring up. We know that new locations are springing up. So these things, these effects should de decrease over time. No, they didn't, right? This was a very surprising result. And when I presented it, other researchers came up to me and said that they have found the same thing in other industries, in other countries, that you're seeing more and more concentration where we would expect to see less and less concentration. Wow. It's such an interesting area, right, that mm -hmm. in this world of everything going virtual, we're, we're going to focus on, you know, co-location still being relevant and important to create create knowledge that's that's I, such great stuff i think it's because of the the tacitness of it you know mm -hmm. that that there is something that you get from collocation that you really can't get through Zoom or through a phone call. Um, and again, it's it's this idea that when I am uh, located with you, I can more easily explain to you what I'm really talking about and you are more readily understanding what I'm saying, right? Um, and it's it's really that tacitness because, um, and that's what that's what firms are after. And so as a result, you know, you're seeing kind of this this need to try to return workers back to the office to increase their productivity. Well, what is productivity if it's not basically sharing information? I think it's also I'm a psychologist, so I'm always going to look at trust, right? You also you've, you'll share more with those you trust, right. and you Absolutely. trust those who you spend more time with. So Absolutely. Really Absolutely. great stuff. So Anna, just to close out, what advice would you give a, a global business professional today about this area of, you know, lo location and clusters and all I, spillover? I think that's a really good question. You know, business leaders know a lot about location because it's one of the most consequential decisions that they make in terms of where to actually locate their subsidiary or where to locate their manufacturing plant. Um, so there's a lot of information that they know and they have consultants and they have reports that they compile um, that they weigh the benefits and, and uh, costs of different locations. Um, but one thing that I'm seeing is that there's an emerging criticism of foreign firms in developing countries, that they're not engaging enough with the local ecosystem, mm -hmm. that they are there to exploit uh, labor cost differences, uh, but they're not really giving back and in terms of giving back, that doesn't necessarily mean you have to, again, disclose your knowledge. But it could be things like um, setting up training programs. Often multinationals just say, you know what, I'm going to train these workers. I, I have the training programs. I can do it myself. I don't want to, you know, engage with local universities or colleges or institutes to try to train a cohort of students because I have my own program that I can do on my own and I don't need this. Um, and that's, you know, again, serving, uh, it, it's sending the wrong signal, if you will. Um, they don't engage enough in terms of maybe setting up conferences and bringing in speakers uh, to try it. Again, they don't have to disclose anything themselves, but just share kind of what's happening in, in other areas. Right? Um, they don't engage enough in business associations. They sometimes for form their own business association of foreign companies, right? <laughs> so almost, again, uh, an exclusionary uh, action, right? And, and are not necessarily eager participants in the local business associations. Um, and so, again, there are many opportunities for them to engage with the local ecosystem and try to make it as a win-win situation instead of, I'm just here to exploit your low-cost labor and take things but not really contribute. Yeah. So be an active member of the communities that you're in. Right. Wherever they are in the world, be a part of that, of that community. Such great advice. Anna, thank you so much for being part of International Business Today. Thank you, Paula. I enjoyed being here. Thank you for joining us for today's episode of International Business Today. If you enjoyed it, please share it with your network. As always, we would love to hear from you.